Hello and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Kate. I'm Laura. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get people talking. Today we're discussing The Country of Others by Leila Slimani. It's the first of a planned trilogy telling the story of one French Moroccan family. It's been translated from the original French into English by Sam Taylor, and it's the latest book read by my book club. Leila Slimani is a French Moroccan author whose previous novels have been highly successful. Her first, Adèle, is about a woman addicted to illicit sexual encounters. She then wrote Chanson Douce, or Lullaby, which won her international acclaim and the prestigious Prix Goncourt in France, and made for a fabulous book discussion, as you'll hear if you go back into our archive and listen to episode 30. Her next book, Sex and Lies, is a non-fiction investigation into the sex lives of Moroccan women. Slimani has also been busy as French President Emmanuel Macron's personal representative for promoting French language and culture. Her latest book has been described by The Times as a panoramic, ambitious tale, while author Salman Rushdie found it exceptional. What, though, did my book club make of it? Did we love it or loathe it? And was it a good book club read? Keep listening to find out, here on The Book Club Review. Book club! Feels like we haven't (laughs) done one of these in so long. It has been a while. We ought to get back to our roots. I know, our roots. So I can't wait to get into this. How did your book club come to choose this one? It was me. It was me, Kate. I saw Leila Salani's latest book, which I would note is called In the Country of Others in the North American Market. I saw it at the library and was really intrigued, but wasn't sure I was going to read it by myself. You mentioned this in the intro, but my book club read and discussed Lullaby, Slimani's kind of breakthrough novel in English. My book club really loved Lullaby. I think that's true. Whereas I vehemently disliked it. So I was intrigued to see what we would make of this one. I listened to that episode this morning, actually, and you're absolutely right. You were the real outlier and you complained because even our guest, Chloe Dunbar, and I were also relentlessly positive about it. <laughs> and I think you felt a little bit, uh, I think bullied was the word you used. <laughs> really? Did I? Yeah. Oh, I'm not usually such a shrinking violet. I'm usually up for a fight. But this is a very different book, isn't it? Tell us what it's about. Well, it's not a family memoir, but it is a novel inspired by Leila Slamani's own family history. Her grandmother was a French war bride who married a Moroccan man and went and settled in Morocco in the post-war period. We'll get to that, you know, how much of this is based on her true family history, how much is fictionalized. But just looking at the blurb, this is how it's described there. After World War II, Mathilde leaves France for Morocco to be with her husband, whom she met while he was fighting for the French army. A spirited young woman, she now finds herself a farmer's wife her vitality sapped by the isolation, the harsh climate, and the mistrust she inspires as a foreigner. But she refuses to be subjugated or confined to her role as a mother of a growing family. As tensions mount between the Moroccans and the French colonists, Mathilde's fierce desire for autonomy parallels her adopted country's fight for independence in this lush and transporting novel about race, resilience, and women's empowerment. Is that the same blurb that you have? Because I don't like that. I don't think that's an accurate description of the novel. (laughs) I wasn't actually really listening to the words you were saying. I was just listening to your voice thinking, oh, that's nice. Nice to hear Laura's voice. (laughs) I have her her rapt attention, listeners. We haven't spoken in a little while, so I'm really sorry I can't answer to that. (laughs) What does your blurb say? Does it talk about a spirited young woman and Mathilde's fierce desire for autonomy paralleling her adopted country's fight? No, it doesn't. Okay. All right. So Alsace, 1944. Mathilde finds herself falling deeply in love with Amine Bellage, a Moroccan soldier billeted in her town fighting for the French. After the liberation, Mathilde leaves her country to follow her new husband to Morocco. But life here is unrecognisable to this brave and passionate young woman. Suffocated by the heat of the Moroccan climate, by her loneliness on the farm, by the mistrust she inspires as a foreigner, and by their lack of money, Mathilde grows restless. As violence threatens and Morocco's own struggle for independence grows daily, Mathilde and Amin's refusal to take sides sees them and their family at odds with their own desire for freedom. How can Mathilde, a woman whose life is dominated by the decisions of men, hold her family together in a world that's being torn apart? Mm, That is quite different. I think it's much better. You won't know what the differences are. 
but listeners and I do. And I think what's interesting <laughs> there is just the focus on Mathilde and this, this idea that it's all about her desire for autonomy. Whereas actually, I read it a lot more as a partnership between Mathilde and Amin, and their quite dysfunctional, but at heart loving relationship, a sort of battle against the elements and the forces that are opposed to them as they try to carve out a life together. Well, <laughs> let's discuss. But first, we have a clip. The audiobook is published by Faber and Faber, read by Nabia Akari. She had felt the same dismay when she first landed in Rabat on the 1st of March 1946. Despite the desperately blue sky, despite the joy of seeing her husband again and the pride of having escaped her fate, she was afraid. It had taken her two days to get there. From Strasbourg to Paris, from Paris to Marseille, then from Marseille to Algiers, where she'd boarded an old junkers and thought she was going to die. Sitting on a hard bench, among men with eyes wearied from years of war, she'd struggled not to scream. During the flight she wept, vomited, prayed. In her mouth she tasted the mingled flavors of bile and salt. She was sad, not so much at the idea of dying above Africa as at appearing on the dock to meet the love of her life in a wrinkled, vomit-stained dress. At last she landed safe and sound, and Emin was there, more handsome than ever, under a sky so profoundly blue that it looked as though it had been washed in the sea. Her husband kissed her on both cheeks, aware of the other passengers watching him. He seized her right arm in a way that was simultaneously sensual and threatening. He seemed to want to control her. They took a taxi, and Mathilde was finally able to nestle close to Emin's body, to feel his desire, his hunger for her. We are staying in the hotel tonight, he told the driver, and as if trying to defend his morality, added, This is my wife. She just arrived. For me, Mathilde was the character that I was invested in, the character that I cared about. Or so I thought, but then one of the things I really admired about the book is the way that Slimani seemingly effortlessly does flip from character to character. And so sometimes you're in Amin's head and you're getting his perspective and sometimes you're in Aisha's. They have two children, Aisha and Salim. And Aisha is, what, sort of five, six, seven throughout the course of this? Yeah, I think she's probably ten by the end, roughly. It's kind of her early childhood, her formative years, would you say? Yeah, and so. I think the reason we're being vague is because the timeline of this book is so brilliantly done. You use the word effortless, and this novel feels effortless. I don't usually love novels that cover so much ground. It's fair to say we've roughly got 10, 15 years here. Yes, I think it's 10. I think I read that each novel in this trilogy was going to be around 10 years. What she does, though, is she, whole years can pass in a paragraph or two, and then she'll just sort of zoom in on the present moment, our present moment, with such a vivid depiction that it pulls together this wider narrative arc. And I don't know how she does it. It was effortless. And I thought her style had changed dramatically from Lullaby. Which, and maybe that's a translation thing. I'm not sure if they were done by the same translator. I think they were. I think Sam Taylor is her English translator. So maybe it's Slimani adopting or evolving into a slightly different literary style for this subject matter. And that's a moment to say, I think it's a wonderful translation. You know, sometimes with translated books, there's just something about the syntax of a sentence or there's something which slightly jolts you out and makes you think, oh, I remember I'm reading a translated book, but there was never a moment of that with this. The writing just flows. It's so vivid. It's so powerful. And I think credit to this excellent translation. But I was going to say that's interesting because for me, I almost felt she's such a pacey writer. You know, her books have this momentum. You feel like you're careering through a story. Certainly Lullaby, the story about the nanny that kills the two children, had this really explosive structure where it starts with this incredibly dramatic event and then the rest of the novel is a kind of why done it and it's one where I certainly sat and compulsively read that in one go. This is very different particularly when you know it's going to be a trilogy and so there is a sense of a slower pace but actually I felt it could have been longer. 
and I would have loved it to have <laughs> yeah. been longer. I almost felt like she wasn't giving herself enough time to really develop these characters. And I was really interested to read an interview with her where she talked about how she grew up reading the French classics. She really admired these long Russian and French family sagas. And she said, and I asked myself, would I be able to write such a book one day after Lullaby, after the Pre-Goncourt? I wanted a really challenging project. And so, yeah, I love that this is a trilogy, but there was almost something, a little bit of a sense of skating through. And I would have loved it if it had just settled even more. Good thing there's going to be another two books then. (laughs) There's a lot of drama, isn't there, from the moment that Matilda arrives. And one of the other interesting things that I've read, Simone talked about how her novels are about disillusionment. Lullaby was about the disillusionment of the idea of motherhood or parenthood. This is about the idea of Matilde's disillusionment because she thinks she's going off to this. Well, she doesn't really have any idea about the country that she's going off to. She has almost a kind of idea it's going to be like a fairy story or something. And then the reality when she gets there, from the very beginning, when she and her husband, Amin, are traveling to this land that he owns, this farm where they're going to live in the countryside, and they're traveling on a sort of horse-drawn cart and the driver is whipping the horse to make it go more quickly and she begs him not to and reaches out and he threatens to turn the whip on her so from the very beginning you see all those delusions and her naivete it all comes crashing down on her and at that moment you're like oh no you know how is she going to survive she is an incredibly realized character and she's also an incredibly flawed character and so i felt quite a lot of impatience with her at moments as i've started to reread it while equally understanding that she is very young. I think she's only 20 when she arrives. Amin is 28. As you say, she's naive. And not only that, she aspires to a beautiful lifestyle, like what she sees on the film screens. And so there's this huge gap between her expectations of her life and the reality she's living. And at the same time, I felt a little bit of sympathy with Amin, who is like, look, this is our life together. This is what we've chosen. My mother never cried. You're crying every single moment of the day. I guess I had sympathy for both of them. I also wanted Matilda to toughen up a little. But then she does, I think. One of the things I think Slimani does really brilliantly is that her characters aren't straightforwardly likeable or dislikable. They have moments where you like them. They have moments where you root for them. They have moments where you feel like they're doing the right thing. And then they have moments where they behave really badly and you feel really depressed. And she takes you into their inner thoughts so you understand why they might be behaving the way that they do. With Matilde's husband, Amin, he is a Moroccan man, but he has served with the French army. He's now going back to Morocco. And in France, he is a Moroccan man. In Morocco, he's a colonized man. And Simone wrote about how that comes with a certain amount of humiliation. And as a result of that humiliation, he becomes violent himself and then visits that violence on Matilde and his family. But you understand, or she's trying to explore, I think, where it's coming from, which is why it's so interesting. Every key player in this novel is somehow subjugated or confined in their role. It's not as simple as just women are subjugated, as you flag. Amin is very subjugated and disempowered in his role and trying to navigate his identity as a Moroccan man, as an independent farmer, as a father, a husband to a white French woman, and then his own experience having been in the French army. It's also this wider political context, which is very alive, very active. It affects the dynamics of everything hugely, which is the French colonists who are there, who are farming, who at this point in time have the status, have the power, have the support of the government. Well, they are the government. (laughs) This is important to say. (laughs) And then, I mean, you know, Moroccan men who are trying to make their way. And so, I mean, is frustrated because he is not getting the support. He's not getting the government loans. He's sort of ostracized to a certain degree. I mean, it was quite an interesting experience reading about this because on the one hand, she writes about it all so vividly. And so you feel the emotion of what's happening. But intellectually, as an outsider and someone who doesn't know much about the history of Morocco, doesn't know much about the history of the French colonisation of Morocco, I found myself a bit at sea. And I did a couple of times stop and go to the internet to look up Moroccan history, (laughs) because I thought I don't quite understand the context of this. I'm not clear about the power dynamics and what's going on, because it's at the moment when Morocco was starting to fight for independence. 
but we mm. haven't quite got there yet. So this is the early rumblings of that. And then I'm guessing the French retaliation, right? Oh, interesting. You've done more reading than me. Well, that's interesting that you're looking even more vague than me, because one of the things I think you can do <laughs> is just read this book without knowing anything. I don't think you need to know about this history in order to enjoy this book for what it is, which is this incredibly vivid, powerful family story. But it's interesting that it seemed almost slightly strange to me that you don't get more context, but perhaps it's because she's writing for an audience who know this. But what we should say, and I think this is a good segue, is that there is a risk when we read novels and think we are getting a full picture. I do this too. We're all armchair travelers through novels, right? And I love a novel. I love a historical novel. I love a novel about another culture. And in some ways, I do tend to think, aha, I now have a better understanding of that culture or that period in time. And I was racing through this novel quite uncritically because of the paciness of her writing and the drama that she injects throughout. And I posted it on Instagram, just saying, you know, I'm loving this really quickly on a story. And someone reached out to me, someone by the name of Yusra, who is Moroccan British. And it was a simple message. She just said, most Moroccans who read it agree that Lila Slimani is a colonialism apologist. Her take on a difficult period in the country's history is a bit controversial, to put it mildly. <laughs> and that's all she said. And I was just like, oh, oh, <laughs> tell me more. And listeners, we were able to reach out to Yusra and talk to her in some depth about her view of the country of others and just give us a different perspective. Well, that sounds like a good moment then to listen to a little bit of that chat that we had with her. It went on for over half an hour. Laura and I could easily have sat and chatted to her for an hour and a half. <laughs> it was so and interesting. Yusra, I'm so sorry, but just for time, obviously, we've just had to clip out bits here and there. But let's hear a little bit of that conversation where she began by telling us a little bit about herself. My name is Yusra. I'm Moroccan, British. I live in England. We've been living here for 11 years now. I love reading. I have a passion for books. I have a bachelor in French literature and a master's degree in language and communication in English. I love reading in French, Arabic, and English as well. I have a real passion for international literature. <laughs> That's about me, really. <laughs> so which language then did you read The Country of Others in, seeing as you have so many options? <laughs> I'll be honest. I looked in Kindle, and the French version was a bit more expensive than the English version. So I went for the English version. This is the first time I've read Leila Slimani in English. Usually I read her books in French, but this time I read it in English. And would it have been translated then into Arabic? Is there an Arabic version? Not that I know mm. of. To be honest, most Moroccan writers who write in other languages do not really bother translating into Arabic simply because Moroccan readership is very diverse and most people read in French. We are mostly a bilingual country. That makes me curious what language Moroccan literary heavyweights are writing in. Are they writing in Arabic or are they choosing to write in French? Lately, there's more writers writing in Arabic, but the first prominent writers were writing in French. The likes of Dris Shraibi, Tahar Ben Jilloun, they were celebrated in France and in Morocco. And they've had a French education, so naturally they wrote in French, but they are very much celebrated in Morocco as well. But we notice more and more Moroccan authors born and bred in Morocco with a Moroccan education who choose to write in Arabic, not just Arabic, in Moroccan Arabic, which is not to make things complicated for you, is a little bit different from classical Arabic that you would find in other Arab countries. And so... For Laura and me and for our book clubs, this is a novel that we're reading very much in terms of narrative and plot. And she writes these incredibly vivid characters and yes. it's a family story that you get very drawn into. Definitely, as an outsider, you're very aware of the sense of the different cultures and this idea of a colony, a colonial country. But I feel like to a Moroccan reader, there's clearly a whole range of layers and nuances that we are not alive yes, to. So I think what Laura absolutely. and I are really curious about is... Yeah how this book sits with you, how it impacted you when you read it? I mean, in terms of style, I'll give it to you. She writes beautifully. But to me, it's style over substance, basically. I found it very flawed and extremely detrimental to Moroccans. It is supposed to be a multi-voiced or multi-point-of-viewed novel because it's not just about Mathilde. All the other characters are given a voice. 
So I was expecting to have a more of a balance, but I didn't find that. It was very much a colonist account of that period of the history of Morocco. It was even more painful for me because I am from the same city where mm. all the events happened. I am from Meknes. So I knew every little street detail she talked about. I know it. I grew there. Even the school where Aisha used to go, I used to borrow books from that school. It felt like, okay, this is my city, this is my country, but the characters, no. I didn't identify with them, I didn't relate to them, and I didn't even like them. They didn't make sense to me. It was just too much for me in terms of cliches and stereotypes. Men are bloodthirsty, they're violent, they are ignorant. Women are sensual but brainless. I mean, even the food, she hated on the food. I draw a line there. You can disparage Moroccan men as much as you like. I'll turn the blind eye. But Moroccan food, no, sorry, you can't do that. Moroccan That's food is okay. delicious. <laughs> Leave Moroccan food alone. And Moroccan women as well. You know, women at that period in the 50s, they were so full of optimism because they knew that it was a new wave. Something big is happening. We're going to get our independence and we're going to get our rights. And the way they are depicted in the book is just insulting. Because to me, it was insulting to my mom, my aunts, who grew up in that period, who had huge, big dreams. They were supported by their brothers, their parents, their husbands. So it doesn't resonate with my Morocco, especially after that period. And so I asked her listeners, what did she think was happening with Slimani and her views? I think she's heavily influenced by her own family, her own history. Her grandma is the one who inspired the character of Mathilde. And she grew up in a heavily influenced background, culturally influenced background by the French culture. When you go to a French school, you don't study Moroccan history. You study French history. So everything you study is from a French perspective with a French scope. And the French scope was France for civilisatrice, French civilizing power. That's the narrative that every single one who go to a French school is thought. I don't even think it's conscious. It's just the way you are brought up. And then you move to France and that continues. Let's not forget that Slimani have been appointed Macron's representative for promoting French culture. She is very much a French writer. I don't have the right to take away her Moroccan identity, but I can see it in her books. That's the struggle for me. I wanted more balance. And then we went on to talk about a few of the characters that felt problematic. The sister, Selma, who is this sensual, gorgeous beauty. And I actually highlighted a passage with fresh eyes as I reread the book. Selma radiated sensuality. Her eyes were as dark and shiny as the olives that Muilala marinated in salt. Her thick brows, her lush hair, the faint brown fuzz on her upper lip made her look like Carmen, a vision of Mediterranean sultriness, a vibrant fever dream of a brunette, capable of driving men wild. And I reread that and was like, oh, yeah, that is quite over the top. <laughs> and one of my complaints about Lullaby was that I thought that Slimani was going for an easy, sensationalist topic. And it does feel with Yusra sharing some of her insight that there are certain cases throughout this book where she's going more for sensation than for depth or authenticity. I think it is more nuanced than that, because we do know that as a writer, Slimani is deeply concerned with the position of women in Moroccan society. And we see that Selma's dreams of a future, of being able to choose her own romantic partner, are dashed. And thanks to Amin, fairly summarily, she's married off to a character who doesn't seem like a great option, although maybe he's not as bad as we think. And all of this is intensified and exacerbated by her physical beauty. So, you know, it felt to me more like Selma was a symbol of every young Moroccan woman who wanted to choose her own future but was denied in this deeply repressive patriarchal society. That's certainly the way that Slimani seems to be viewing it, but maybe what Yusra is showing us is that in her own decisions about how she's chosen to dramatise it, perhaps she's bringing the viewpoint of European feminism to bear when there seems to be a real debate, a real internal debate over how Moroccan women view their history and their situation. 
And then there's the other layer, which is that Slimani is basing her characters on family members. So <laughs> if we're assuming her aunt is the Selma character, how true to that real life woman is this character, right? She might be slightly hamstrung by the actual family members she had. Yes, Lamani was asked about this in an excellent interview that she did with Words Without Borders, which most of the time I've been quoting things, that's where it's come from. And she said, of course, I use my own experience, but I also use what my grandmother told me about the life she had when she arrived in Morocco. I'm very lucky because my grandmother, my aunt and my mother were great storytellers. My grandmother loved Morocco and by the end of her life, she had become a Moroccan woman. But she was also very critical of the country for its treatment of women, its poverty and its social classes. She was very critical of colonialism as well. She was a white French woman, but French people hated her because she betrayed them by doing something that was considered very scandalous, having sex with an Arab. It was accepted when it was a Frenchman having sex with an Arab woman. Frenchmen conquered the country, after all, so they could conquer the women too. But it was different when it was a white woman having sex with my grandfather, who was dark-skinned and very manly. And this tension that's woven into this relationship between Matilda and Amin and Leila Slimani, I think, is one of those writers who writes really, really, really well about sex. I found <laughs> the ups and downs of their physical relationship and the way that that's woven in. It never felt gratuitous. It always felt like it needed to be there. And she wrote about it well. And I found it believable. I have to say, I really bought into the very intense dynamic of that relationship between them, which could ebb from love and passion to anger, hatred, resentment. You know, it was all mm. boiling away in there. We haven't talked about Omar, though, the brother, who is given no space as the family's one and only freedom fighter to voice mm. why he wants French independence. And you make this point that the Moroccan history, the historical events that are swirling around this family are sort of pushed to the periphery. And they are. But that leaves you with an angry young man who just wants to be violent. And Yusra spoke to how problematic that was because freedom fighters were not terrorists. They came from all cross sections of society and were asking for independence. And yet Slimani paints Omar as an inarticulate, violent young man. And that's our representative of the freedom movement. Yes, I agree. Omar does like a slightly exaggerated character. And he's definitely there to ramp up the drama when he's on the page. It's, it's always sort of dangerous. <laughs> you never quite know what's going to happen. I wanted to reassure you, Sarah, in our talk, I don't think I actually got to it, that the descriptions that are shared of Morocco in this book, I did read them as from Mathilde's perspective. And mm. therefore, I read them as biased colonial perspectives. Yes, because um, one, one of her complaints is the way that the countryside is ugly, that people are dirty and uneducated and there's no culture, there's no refinement. That is the vision that you're shown. And maybe if you have more context, you're able to decode that more carefully. And as you say, we're seeing it from Matilde's perspective. And Matilde's view is biased and blinkered. Mm. But to someone like Yusra, reading about almost people she knows and places that she knows, I could see that mm. that would be quite difficult. Come on then, what did your book club think? None of them are from Mechnes, I take it. <laughs> we all enjoyed it. I mean, it is that kind of book, I think, that you can just get swept up in. And there is enough drama in there, more than you might expect for a novel inspired by a family memoir. So honestly, we had a fairly high level discussion praising it. And then at that point, Yusra had already messaged me on Instagram. So we had already dug into some of her issues with the book. So I was able to elevate them to the book club and hear what they thought. And Yusra gave us that gift, really, I think, to be more critical of this book. So one of those books where it's really valuable to actually do a little research and it's all about dialogue. Yeah, it's what we love. It's why we love to read because it's in that debate and in that exchange of views and being challenged on some assumptions that for me lies the fun. It's a nicely divisive book, it seems, looking online. This review made me laugh. Another example of misery porn, hardship and boredom served up as entertainment. If it hadn't been my book club's choice this month, I would have saved myself the tedium of reading it past page 50. 
Quite a surprising view, given I think you could say a lot of things about this book, but boring wouldn't be one of them. <laughs> I'd love it if it was one of my book club members yeah. well, I did <laughs> covertly that, posting on Goodreads. I almost felt like it was something that Andy might say in my book club. <laughs> <laughs> Only if he was feeling contrary. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The book doctor, who reviews extensively, it seems, gave it four stars. It is a powerful, immersive and engaging novel about a family struggle against hostile surroundings. But it's also a story that in an original way sheds light on the origins of many of the most acute conflicts in our time. All the characters in this novel live in the land of others, settlers, natives, peasants and refugees. Women above all live in the country of men and must constantly fight for their emancipation. Highly recommended. Amanda Jenkinson, meanwhile, gave it two stars. I found this novel strangely lacklustre and, well, ordinary. Surprising, really, after Slimani's earlier novels, which I found original and compelling. Not that I didn't enjoy this one, it's a pleasant enough read, but it seemed to be missing something, and I failed to fully engage with the characters and their plight. There were very few surprises in the book, and in fact it was all pretty predictable, and although important themes are explored, race, class, interracial relationships, colonialism and decolonisation, it all just felt flat somehow. Nevertheless, the book mostly held my attention. I wanted to see how it all panned out for the family, but a certain magic was definitely lacking. KF gave it four stars. This is not a book to read for entertainment. Its characters and subject matter are too disturbing for that. But it is a book to read for an understanding of how different cultures can clash and how what is unacceptable in one culture is a part of everyday life in another. Slimani doesn't hold back from describing violence, abuse or bloodshed, but it's not done in a gratuitous way. It's simply part of the lives of the characters, the country and the time the story is set. This book is not just a gripping insight into the country of others, but into the clashes of cultures that still form a part of our world. The second book in the trilogy is out in French, if you wanted to challenge yourself, Kate. Yeah, I actually read her book Adele in French. And even with my imperfect understanding of that language, it was a really powerful compulsive read. But I would be the first to admit that most of the nuances were probably lost on me. So yeah, <laughs> better wait for the English version, I think, for this one. I had one more I wanted to read. Kay Radford gave it five stars. Full disclosure, I loved Leila Slamani's previous book, Lullaby, so was thrilled to read her latest novel, The Country of Others. I found this book heartbreakingly sad at times. The depiction of life for women in a country full of traditions and ideas that mean they have no say and virtually no freedom seems alien to a modern-day reader. Mathilde's desperate search for happiness and fulfilment is so movingly portrayed. Amin is at times a modern thinker, especially when it comes to the education of his daughter and his farming practices. But then he contradicts this by his attitude to his younger sister, who is forced into a marriage against her will. The book is set against the backdrop of Morocco fighting for independence from France, and I found this fascinating as it's a subject I know virtually nothing about, and it made me want to find out more. I love this book, and giving it only five stars seems inadequate for what is, in my opinion, fabulous, masterly writing. I can't wait to read Leila Slimani's next book, and the one after too. I love Leila Slimani's writing. I did love this book, although I'm fascinated by the knowledge that Yusra brought to my reading of it, and the debate that it's clearly going to stimulate in France and in Morocco or has done already, which will be ongoing as the subsequent volumes come out. But, you know, mainly I just think, what a writer. She is incapable of writing a boring sentence. I love that about her. I love her ambition. I love her fearlessness. You know, she's not afraid. Many people faced with the kind of backlash and criticism that I think fairly regularly comes her way would hesitate and draw back. And I'm in awe of her bravery and fearlessness and conviction that she has, all of which for me made it a very worthy read. And I love it for Book Club. I think it's such an interesting one to discuss. I think that's absolutely right. It's an interesting one to discuss. It's one of those books where you should be aware of your own ignorance and your own bias and try to counteract that. If you don't have Yusra reaching out to you, I think there are other ways to do that. But what Slimani has done, perhaps, in being who she is and being such a breakthrough talent she has opened up more space for more diverse voices to come through and tell their versions of Morocco and to bring more richness to readers like us. Here are some more recommendations inspired by the country of others. And of course, having got her, we couldn't resist asking Yusra for hers. One of my favourite authors is Fouad Laroui. Fouad Laroui is Moroccan, but he lives in Amsterdam. He grew up in Morocco, studied in Morocco, 
He went to a French school, but he came from very humble background. He worked as an engineer in Morocco. And his accounts are hilarious, but very on point, very on point about Moroccan culture. And fortunately, he writes in French. Most of his books are not translated into English. This one in particular, it's called Une année chez les Français, A Year with the French. It's his account when he went to study at a French institution. It's inspired by him, but it's a fiction. And the way he talks about the casual racism, it was post-independence, so in the late 60s, early 70s. It's such a wonderful account about the French who stayed in Morocco, who were running the school, but his classmates. An absolutely lovely book. I absolutely love that book. And I wish, I really wish that book was translated into English because it, it's such a good book. It's called uh, Une année chez les Français by Fouad Laroui. But my Moroccan go-to writer, if you want to, is called Laila Lalami. She is Moroccan and writes in English. Hooray! Born in Morocco, she lives in the U.S. She teaches at an American university. And she wrote a wonderful book called The Moor's Account. It's the story of a young Moroccan merchant in the 16th century. He'd been enslaved. So it's inspired from a real character. He'd been enslaved and then sent with a mission to discover the Americas. So this man, who is called Mustafa Zamouri, was the first African Arab to set foot in the Americas. And of this mission, only three people survived. Historical accounts talk about the two Spaniards, but they discard his own account. So Laila Alamidi did a very fantastic search. I mean, it's a very heavily researched book. And she found his own accounts about his adventure, his encounter with the Native Americans, with his master as well, and the army captains. And she gave him his voice back. It's just a fantastic book. It's been long listed for the Main Booker Prize in 2015 and finalist for the 2015 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. So it's been highly acclaimed. So yeah, when I want to read Moroccans, I read Leila Lalami or Fouad Laroui. I wanted to recommend This Blinding Absence of Light by Tahar Benjaloun. It is actually a Yusra recommendation, um, but one she gave to me personally over Instagram after we'd been going back and forth. In Yusra's words, it depicts the harrowing journey of a Moroccan prisoner incarcerated in the infamous Tazmamart prison, secretly built for political dissidents. It's beautifully written and quite faithful to the account of the former prisoner. Now, Kate, I mean, we've been saying throughout this that we've really felt our ignorance of Moroccan history. I still feel that ignorance. What we should seek out is probably a history to really ground our knowledge. But this book is a sliver of a lived historical experience where after a failed revolution against the king, I think this was in the 1970s, a whole swath of serving officers in the army were imprisoned. And they were imprisoned underground in these small cells with barely any light coming through, and they could not stand up. And they were not treated in any way in fair conditions. And so when they finally emerged decades later, they had actually lost almost like a foot in height. And this sounds so harrowing. And I said to Yusra, I was like, I can't read that. But it's written in a very economical way. So it's disturbing, but it's not distressing as you're reading. It's more that it sticks with you. And you think about, you know, these terrifying human rights abuses that have happened in the past and that very likely continue to happen in all sorts of places around the world. It has something of the I don't want to say Kafka-esque, but there is something of that like Sisyphean, like what are you left with when life is not worth living and yet you persevere? What happens to a human being? What happens to the way they think and how do they sustain themselves in those impossible conditions? Yeah, something about resilience, which it's always good to examine. My book recommendation was a bit of a serendipitous find in my little free library. It's called All Men Want to Know. And it's by a French writer called Nina Bouraoui. She is actually French-Algerian. She has an Algerian father and a French mother. So like Slimani, she spent most of her youth in her home country, in her case, Algeria. And then she moved to France. It's autofiction, that blend of memoir and fiction that I always tend to love, actually. And it explores that sense of placelessness, a sense of not belonging quite to either country. And as Slamani has said, to people who are in that position, they have to create their own identities as they go along. And 
for Burawi, it was doubly problematic because she's gay. And this isn't something that she was able to express in her home country, where I imagine perhaps similar to Morocco, there were fairly um, strict rules about how women could conduct themselves. And like Slimani, she's from an affluent middle class family. Her parents worked in the oil industry, but her mother is raped. And as a result, they leave Algeria and they go to live in France. It's such an interesting book and a really lovely book, actually. It's not long and it flips between her childhood in Algeria and her feelings about this childhood, which reminded me a bit of the way Françoise Sagan writes in Bonjour Tristesse, this quite economical language, but where you sort of feel the sun on your skin and you smell the wild thyme in the air and it gives you this real sense of her experience, her memories of this place, contrasted with her life in contemporary Paris, where she's going to nightclubs to try and meet women and exploring that side of her identity. And then every so often, in quite an understated way, these devastating glimpses into some very difficult things that her family were experiencing, different members of her family were experiencing, and how that impacted on all of them. So it's a really interesting book. It won the English Pen Award it's apparently been an international bestseller. Sarah Waters calls it intense, gorgeous, troubling and seductive. And I had never heard of it. I was very happy to have read it. I really enjoyed it. And I think it would be a really interesting one for book club. I have one final recommendation to throw in because I set off for the public library as ever, inspired from our discussion with Yusra a few days ago. And I picked up Year of the Elephant, A Moroccan Woman's Journey Towards Independence and Other Stories. And it's a short story collection published in 1989 by a female Moroccan writer. I started to read the title story and, you know, it was quite dramatic how different it was to be inside the head and perspective of a woman who has grown up in Morocco. You know, that contrast with Mathilde's perspective. Anyway, I've only just started the main story about this woman who returns to her hometown having been divorced after 20 years of marriage because actually she's not able to blend in with the modern life that he actually wants. She's from a more traditional upbringing and hasn't made that leap with him. I mentioned it to Yusra and she said, yeah, I remember studying that in school. So that's by Leila Abu Zaid and seems really great. I'm going to keep going. Well, we will put all those titles and spellings crucially in the show notes so that you can find them. That's nearly it for this episode. Our book recommendations were Une année chez les Français by Fouad Larouy and The Moor's Account by Leila Lalami, This Blinding Absence of Light by Taha Ben Jaloun, All Men Want to Know by Nina Bouraroui, and Year of the Elephant by Leila Abouzid. The audiobook of The Country of Others is published by Faber and Faber and available from audiobook retailers. We loved hearing from our book club and from Yusra on The Country of Others, but what did you think? Did you know that each podcast episode has a dedicated page on our website where you can find full details about all the books we've recommended, a transcript and a comment section? Scroll down to the link in the show notes or head over to thebookclubreview.co.uk and let us know your thoughts. Comments there do go straight to our inboxes and we will answer them. We would love to hear from you. Let's keep the discussion going. Coming up, we're diving into the world of Fitzcarraldo, the elegant blue and white books that are frequently winning awards. We talk to publisher Jacques Testard and discuss our favourites from the Fitzcarraldo list. If you're looking to expand your reading horizons, don't miss that show. It's coming soon. If you're heading over to the website, you'll also find our complete archive of over 100 shows to browse through, covering books from page turners like Where the Crawdads Sing, to our deep dive into long reads with Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain, or check out any of our bookshelf episodes for a stack of book recommendations and let us help you figure out your next read. You can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast, on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod, or email us at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. This episode was produced and edited by me, Kate Slotover. Do subscribe to us and you can support us by taking a minute to rate and review the show, which helps other listeners find us, but not as much as you just telling your bookish friends about us. So if you've enjoyed the show, please do spread the word. But for now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>